Neighbor good is three words. It's, it's neighbor and how you treat your neighbor. It's how we impact the neighborhood in, in areas that we invest in and it's that word good, good. and bringing good to neighborhoods. So our mission is to create modern homes and workspaces for young professionals uh, and in doing so bring good to neighborhoods ultimately. What's up guys, Craig here. We are in Neighborgood in this amazing building where they combine living and working in one place to make it the most beautiful space ever. Today we are going to be talking to the CEO who's a young property developer who's going to tell us about the entrepreneurial journey that he's been through, the property developments, how he's built this amazing property, what he's doing at Neighborgood. So come with me into the studio for this episode of Coffee with Craig. Murray, thanks for joining us on Coffee with Craig. Um, it's a great space that you have here. And I want to go back a little bit into your story, how you got involved with property. I know previously your, your dad was actually involved in property and he kind of showed you the way. So yeah, I mean, my old man was a bucky builder. Um, I grew up on building sites. Um, born and bred in Durban, um, he uh, was an inspiration to me. We were best mates while he was around, um, so I had an incredible relationship. Um, learned sort of the theoretical side of spinning flats and apartments and stuff like that. He did a couple towards the end of his life and I was uh, fortunate enough to learn from that. Um, and so yeah, I guess property has always been in the blood. Um, I started from a fairly early stage looking at uh, entrepreneurial opportunities at school um, from running under 18 nightclubs to flip, uh, sports clinics to so a were whole you, bunch were you of things. always an entrepreneur was it in I your, didn't in your think blood? I was no I mean I, I you know not an entrepreneur in the sense where you like selling lemonade on the side of the I think I've always been a a team i enjoy teams and i like people um and i like solving problems and i think when you add those two together you know we call them entrepreneurs i mean mm. uh, yeah so i mean i guess um i lean I have a lean towards it um i'm not like an art and art sales person I, i'm not like cutthroat in respect to sort of the traditional property broker or okay. uh, because money does not necessarily drive me so I think um, that's where I am a, not a little bit different. I think like we come from property itself is a very traditional industry that is um, run by very traditional people and obviously finance is the outcome of sort of their desired objectives and it's not necessarily just mine. Uh, okay. There's a lot of other uh, outcomes that we're trying to build as a company. So, so. so did you, after school, how did you get involved? Did you start working with your dad? Um, observing more than working. I think um, he um, was definitely an inspiration. I started slowly sort of looking at his company and finding ways to make it better from, from a branding and marketing perspective initially. I'm not as technical as he was. Um, so that was really cool. Just sort of adding some value there to what he was doing. Um, I started selling houses at university. So I went to law school, for some reason my old man thought it would be a good idea to send me to law school. I would have made a terrible attorney um, <laughs> and yeah, dropped out in the second year, started selling houses and so learning you about- as a state agent? As a broker, okay. yeah. Um, and that, that ended up becoming, looking for sites in the independent papers and got lucky and bought a site for 70 grand that we thought that we didn't know had zoning for 20 units. Um, and so, yeah, that was pre-2008 and managed to whip up a very handwritten feasibility and some interesting images and standing on the side of the road selling. And you and you were just a, a young guy with- I was like 21, with 22. no experience. Yeah, no and experience. That was your, your first dude. Yeah, that so was I mean, it. was it? I mean, that must've been super scary. 
bro it was scary um i think that when you don't know much sometimes it's a blessing because you don't know what when you, you have knowledge yeah you know, <laughs> and then you have something to think about yeah um i think um it was pre 20 2008 so the property cycle mm. was um i mean i'm 35 now it was so i've been I've seen the up and mm. I've seen it down um, and I'm interested to see where we go now, but things we're selling. I mean, so we were selling units at 639,000. That was the number for a two bedroom and 2008 happened. Mm. And I think they lost value at like by 10 to 15%. So we didn't actually make any money in the project, but we came out with um, heaps of experience. And as a 22, yeah. 23 year old, yeah, having amazing. been able to build a development from the ground up, I took the knowledge and the time that I got to spend with my dad in it. Okay. So that was really cool. And then how did your journey unfold from there? Because I know you, you were also very involved with um, developments in the townships. Yes, yeah. So, so that gave me sort of a baptism by fire together with a couple other little developments, um, which so I knew that I loved it and that I was interested in property. At that stage, it was about you know trying to build a balance sheet, and hopefully, two units mm. would become five units, would become ten units. So it was a little bit more um, money centric than it was um, f where we are now. So I'm not as interested in that, although it is a dot we have to um, deal with in terms of making a financially sustainable company. Um, but town, when my old man passed away, um, we didn't have. He wasn't a man that had cash. Uh, so I had to find a way to leverage debt and so township there was a gap in the market because obviously as a result of our history as, as, a, as a nation um, convenience retail was not something that was as present as it is now uh, 15 years ago or, t or 10 years ago even there wasn't as much of it um, there were some pioneers in the industry guys like the McCormacks who did stuff in the 90s but what I could do is leverage um, anchor tenants leases to raise debt. Okay. So Boxer, ShopRite, and we started working with Boxer, who are a KZN based brand. And so we were leveraging, we were looking for township, we were buying buildings opposite taxi ranks, mm -hmm. um, taking the, off the back of a head lease that we had signed with them and taking that lease to the bank. If the deal was 1.6 million Rand, we would sign a lease equivalent to 1.6 million rand to raise 100% of the debt, uh, which means we weren't putting cash in, which gave us the ability to build a balance sheet without cash down. And the banks were a little bit more lenient back lean then. Yeah, a little bit. I mean, we still had to put a little bit down, and okay. so I had to use. So is that how it equity. all kind of started? The town. That's how the township, my township okay. stuff started, um, and then it just slowly, like anything, took shape and. One or two deals a year became three or four, and the smaller deals became bigger deals. And so over about a decade, we've built 25 convenient shopping centers with a, a combined value of approximately a billion rand. But that's sort of, now I look at it and it's been 15 years, but it's taken a, a while. Mm. Most of it that happened in the last seven or but eight now, years. But now tell me, so you didn't go and study property at Varsity. No. You started out working with your dad, but then he passed away. How did you gain all this knowledge to be able to do all these developments? Yeah, I mean, I, just on the ground eh? you just read a lot, you learn, you fail, you learn, you fail, you get up, you, I, I sit with a notebook every day and like just write, write a lot, I read a lot. I. Ha um, surround myself with a lot of people who are have a lot more knowledge than I do so I spend a lot of time learning from people um, asking questions I'm generally very curious as a person wanting to understand things and property is ultimately a business mm. it's income and expenses so it's a tangible asset I love the built environment um, and you just start to understand it I mean I can remember thinking about commercial property and thinking how oh, the heck am i ever with my dad i was looking at residential which mm. i understood first and now we've gone full circle because now i'm back doing residential as well um but it just takes time and you know one year becomes three years becomes 10 years and all of a sudden you've been doing something <laughs> for as long as i have okay. and it, be, it, it becomes a bit easier and it's still not uh it's still not a walk in the park every day and i'm just better at it now than i was when i was 21. Okay. Uh, so so we here now in neighborhood tell us a little yeah. bit about that story i mean yeah. where did where did that come from were you sitting with a notepad <laughs> and you realized there was there was a problem in the property market in cape town 
Yeah, so I mean, Neighbor Good is the evolution of a brand that we started called Good, um, which was actually um, inverted commas, a, a failure to the extent of its financial outcome um, because of the deal structure that we put in place for a particular site and the location was wrong and a few other things. But ultimately, and that was the evolution of another um, property concept called Big Box, which is a township entrepreneurial development platform, which consists of 45 retrofitted containers, uh, which we built in Kwamashu and an anchor tenant where we find funded, educated and mentored young entrepreneurs and townships. Uh, and it still exists today. So one pivoted into the other, which is now, and I hate using the word pivot because it's this, mm. this whole thing, but iteration and maybe is a better word. And so, so basically space is changing. Um, we're thinking about it with lifestyle in mind. Um, if you look at the macro, especially post COVID, traditional offices and regional retail is no longer as relevant as it ever were, were, was. Um, residential uh, is the one thing that costs people more than anything else. So your bond or your, or your rental, and it comes with little or no value. So we wanted to create a service which provided far more value, hospitality centric, lifestyle centric, um, connected to other human beings, uh, where there's events, functions, health and wellness, where we integrated living and working spaces into one product uh, and then layered it with, with customer service and a lot of other value um, where it was frictionless and convenient. So we have, three, you know, three, six, nine, 12 month membership agreements. Um, the reason why we wanted, and then we wanted to make an impact in the neighborhoods that we, we invested in. So neighborhood or neighborhood is three words. It's, it's neighbor and how you treat your neighbor. It's how we impact the neighborhood in, in areas that we invest in. And it's that word good, good. and bringing good to neighborhoods. So our mission is to um, create modern homes and workspaces for young professionals. Uh, and in doing so, bring good to neighborhoods ultimately. Okay. So that's the product that we created. Um, so what, what all do you offer in the space that we're sitting in now? So, um, so this is obviously a content studio that we're sitting in, which is part of it. I mean, I think we recognize that the world is moving toward and people are interested in becoming different professions. Mm. And so content's a big thing. We offer that as just a service um, through our collaboration with Kaya and um, Brad, who you met earlier. And then, so here within our workspace, it's 2000 squares. It's home to 270 of our members. 80% um, sure. of it is. And how, how quickly did you get those 270 members? Three months. Three months. Yeah, yeah, I'm at three to four months. And then and do people plug into that to come and work here and to live here? Uh, I would say 10 to 20% of the people in the space live with us. 80% um, don't live with us. It's, it's very, there are offices here as well, so micro offices of for teams of five to ten, mm -hmm. from two up, upwards to ten. Um, but you plug into our network, so you've got access to all of our other sites across the city. Um, if you live with us at any of our locations across the city, you've got access to our workspace. Um, so we cover your living and working needs ultimately, okay. and amazing. then we layer it. Yeah, with and and you don't also go by traditional lease screens. No, it's a so you're a lot agreement. more flexible. Yeah, super flexible. Um, it's a membership agreement by design, um, which has a number of benefits to to users, and it 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 lays. So we we plug into the neighbourhood, and when I say that, I mean in this particular location, which is Divide Account, we've got agreements with the gym. So it's two hundred bucks a month for gym uh, in the same building. We get uh, discounted coffee at Bootleggers. We've got access to discounts with Sorbet. We're working with Motley CrossFit on the rooftop every Monday. We do mindfulness every Wednesday. We do a lion's head walks most weeks. Um, so okay. yeah, it's a lot of... So it's a lot more than just bricks and mortar. It's water. not just space, yeah. You're getting a service with heaps of benefit. And then, so the one thing I want to ask, so you originally from Durban and yeah. you moved to Cape Town. Yeah. So many people say that transition is really difficult. It's difficult to meet people in Cape Town. And you kind of creating this neighborhood where there's this shared space where yeah. it's easy to make friends. Yeah, super easy. And you can, you know, I keep using the word plug in, I'm probably using it too much, but ultimately it's, it's accessible. So, I mean, we live on our phones mm. and we don't often have, especially post COVID, have access to opportunity to 
meet people mm. these days. People used to go to church a lot, mm. <laughs> like a hundred years ago. It doesn't happen as much. You used to go to the Sunday club, mm. and you know th that doesn't happen. So now we live on our phones and on social, um, and we don't have as much opportunity, in my opinion, to interact with people because we live insanely fast-paced mm. li lives, and professional growth is valued almost more than anything else. So. We tend to isolate ourselves a lot and we're trying as a company to bring that back by using space as a platform to connect people and so by design our spaces are very collaborative and so we focus on big common areas where people can connect yeah. their social groups and all of those good things so i mean you've done you've done a lot in your your short time as a property developer and you're a young guy yeah. i mean what what advice would you have for some young guy getting into property development for the first time uh gotta love it like love bricks and mortar properly um not just for finance but because it you have a, like an intrinsic love for anything and it it's not just for uh, a property player it's for any business ultimately um if you don't love it then you're yeah. not going to want to work the the time that it takes to build up 10 years worth of experience mm. and honestly that's what it takes so it takes time dedication heaps of persistence and um, yeah, like a willingness, and uh, yeah, every entrepreneur says it says it to fail. Mm. Um, it's unfortunately just going to happen. So it makes it a lot easier when you love it as much as I do. Because um, the reason I'm asking this, I've had a couple of guests on Coffee with Craig in the past that are very interested in getting into to property development. So one of uh, them, uh, one of them is a guy named Jack Tonneson, yeah. who was one of our first vlogs where we went to his hockey store. So he was also involved with hockey clinics. Um, so he is very, um, he's very involved in property and wants to get more involved in property development. And then another one is Vaughn Erasmus, who's an estate agent at the moment. So the two of them I know really are trying to connect with people to start their whole journey in property yeah, development. Yeah, I mean, I, it's, a, it's a, number one, I mean, educating yourself is probably the biggest thing. And I'm not talking about a degree, I'm talking mm -hmm. about like the amount of content out there at the moment is insane. So you've got choice, you've got podcasts like yours, you've mm -hmm. got podcasts like bigger pockets you've got a lot of content out there that can educate you and the more you plug into that the better you will become as a as a property person are you, are you still learning all the time all the time yeah i'm always listening to stuff i'm always reading i'm always on my phone and stuff okay. to my detriment <laughs> i mean i've got to switch off at night because otherwise i'll just not sleep but um other thing is is to start so i mean you know realizing that you can buy a million rand bachelor flat uh, leveraging debt uh, and just going through the process of seeing apartments uh, understanding value going to a hundred show days and just practically writing down what rental you can achieve in your mind what the value add looks like uh, how you can then add value to it through either repositioning it or adding value in some way and that, buying and that's what right. you've done a lot. You've repositioned yeah. this whole business, I guess. Yeah, I mean, our business is centered around repositioning physical space that's no longer relevant. And mm -hmm. I guess, you know, in a, in a micro level, if you're looking at apartments that are under, that are either dilapidated or need work, it's the same thing. You're mm -hmm. taking a, a space that is n not as relevant because it's old and tired, buying it at the right price. You're adding value through your own creative expression and through that process you create a value um, and you can you can do that you know quite cleverly using bank debt mm. which unfortunately or fortunately for property people is uh, you can use i mean the, the impact of using debt on on irl calcs and and net income calcs mm. over time is significant um, especially if you can get sort of 90 to 100 percent bonds um, and it means you can pay down your return on cash is a lot higher on, on property, but you don't necessarily enjoy the same private equity returns that you might do running a business that produces higher returns. So sometimes I think maybe a combination of both is the best. Is, is, is the best. You know. And um, where do you see neighborhood going? Um, we're very focused on the city of Cape Town. I think we'll probably, we've got a three year trajectory to get to 2000 apartments within the city of Cape Town. Um, across probably 10 to 15 locations. Um, we're at five locations and I think we'll get to 30 to 35. Um, Over what period of time? Uh, three years. Three years. Yeah, um, that's where my headspace is at. 
and that's a function of the fact that a lot of the CB and for the focus is on Atlantic Seaboard, um, Devartekant, Greenpoint, and the city of Cape Town. I might get to Claremont, uh, Newlands if I feel like there's demand there, and we might look at locations like Musenberg and Frontchuk. But out of that's more for short stay. So our model is you can stay with us for a day or a year, and we can offer you. Um, access to live like a local. Um, so it's a combination of almost like an Airbnb and long term. Yeah, but it's underpinned by brands. So I think mm. where we are very different to Airbnb is that number one, we're not a, necessarily a tech platform, although we leverage tech to make the experience mm. of our users more enjoyable and more frictionless. But we're a brand that speaks to community, um, and it and I think our users identify with us for who we are. And so you stay with us because you want to be part of neighbor good and mm. its people. Whereas if you go to an Airbnb, it's very functional. Mm. You're just um, in and out. It's for you're in and out, pleasure. yeah, it's for, yeah. so the experience of Airbnb is a very different one. I mean, obviously there's a place for it and it's yeah. a massive company. We also are very focused on Cape Town as a lifestyle city because we think that top 20 in the world mm. to live in. And it's Amazing. also very, it's much cheaper than living in New York, Paris, mm. Um, a lot of the other cities and so I think that post COVID when re travel returns what you're going to see is massive 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 pickup in Cape Town okay. uh, which so you're still yeah, very positive on South Africa and Cape Town I'm very positive in Cape Town um, for our product I'm obviously a big fan of South Africa I'm in such a um, and always will be have been like stuck into townships and love mm. you know the country the country and will always be my home but Cape Town is a special place in my heart just simply because I think that it can compete with the rest of the world in terms of its lifestyle proposition. Um, you can't beat the mountain, mm. you can't beat the restaurants, you can't beat yeah. the Seapoint Promenade, yeah, the people, sure. the culture. So there's a lot going for it. Um, and so I think that now in the life cycle of where we are, I don't think there's ever been a period where space is as vulnerable as it is mm. and there and that is a reflection of the share price the listed share price because people are mm. no longer using offices mm -hmm. in the traditional form hotels are no longer relevant at the moment yeah. uh, which is going to hurt i mean it's already hurting everyone mm -hmm. and then um regional retail convenient retail will be fine depending on where it is located but regional won't be at some of it will be like the bigger more dominant assets will will maintain but we're all shopping online i just don't mm -hmm. think you're going to be buying as much as you do in, in physical spaces outside of going to like restaurants and stuff and then last mile logistics will probably be okay as that industry also expands but yeah for us as a brand i think where we can compete much more than the bigger traditional companies that we're entrepreneurial we're flexible we have a hospitality dna i know by the time you leave here i'll know how you take your coffee i'll I'll remember your name for the next 10 years. So we have a, a DNA which is very different mm. to a, a traditional property player who's thinking about distribution mm. growth only. I think that's amazing because you're offering so much more value and, and you, you are living that neighborhood and, yeah. and you're being good. Yeah, we're trying. <laughs> we don't get it right every so, day. So the last thing that I want to ask you is obviously with that amount of growth in such a short period of time, you have to collaborate with others. How are you, how are you doing that? I think by virtue of you know, we're, we're, we're collaborative to the core. I mean, I think that we recognize as a business, we can only, we focus on core, which is living and working in spaces. But life, it, there's so much about living and working in spaces requires collaboration with companies like yourself, uh, with grocery companies, with um, cafes. I mean, we've just moved a company called Bread Morgan Honey in the East City into our location. We've created a much better location. so. In that instance, we've literally taken a business that uh, wasn't struggling, but was located in a not as de desirable space and made their location a lot better and their business a lot better. I think wherever we can add value to our members as a function of bringing us back to serving our mission and vision as a company, we'll collaborate. Um, we are just about to finalize a deal upstairs here with the most insane edutech company that does incredible things globally. Um, so I think, yeah, I'm just really excited about trying to leave the world a better place than mm. we found it. And, you know, we can't do that on our own. I think trying to uh, drive that culture across all 
um, collaborations that we've got for all of our members is a big thing. I mean, we're thinking about doing things more sustainably without just saying it. Um, we, we really believe that we, we need to leave the world a better place than we found it. So I'm, I'm thinking about that and we're thinking about that. It's just part of our culture and we're just encouraging it with all people that we do business with. Um, Amazing. Yeah, Amazing. whether it's tenant of ours, whether it's possible partners. And we, we um, make sure that we work with good people. So it, it sounds a little bit silly, but just mm. we have choice and you can either work with good people or not. And people who align with your DNA, who align with your moral values. Um, we don't claim to be, uh, we don't know it all. We don't try and be better than, we don't think we're better than we are. We learn new things every day, but we do, we do have a set of values that speaks to neighbor good as a brand that we live by every day and yeah i mean that's just something we will do for as long as i'm around that's for awesome. sure awesome awesome mary thanks so much it's, thank been, you, it's been amazing to chat to you and hear your story and thank what you. you've been doing in the neighborhood thank you and what your future plans are. i wish you all the best for thank that. you dude appreciate thank it you. so there we have it what an amazing guest on coffee with craig mary clark doing so much good right here in the neighborhood of cape town what an amazing young man who's a property developer. But if you haven't yet, make sure to destroy that like button. Share some love for Murray. Share some love for Coffee with Craig. Share some love for Cape Town. We are here in the most beautiful place in the world. We will see you very soon on the next episode of Coffee with Craig. Until then, I'm out of here. You know, the, the thing with entrepreneurship that you've got to ask yourself is firstly what you're passionate about. And if you can build a business around your passion, it just works.